Um, my character's name is John Crichton, and he is a scientist who uh, sets out one day to run an experiment orbiting the Earth and gets sucked down a wormhole and finds himself at the other end of the universe. At the other end of the universe, John is surrounded by a group of aliens. And these aliens are prisoners who themselves are escaping and homeless. And he's homeless. This is madness! On the ground! John Crichton is a guy stuck in extraordinary circumstances and spends half of his time going, what the hell is that? He spends a lot of time figuring out what's going on around him and then getting knocked down and getting dragged around and then he pops back up and uh, comes up with an idea to save his butt. This particle analyzer is defective. It's peacekeeper technology, you use it. Taxi is them, not infantry. Yeah. Pilot said you press this, this, and this. Well, it's just like a VCR, except easier. The Creature Shop, Jim Henson Creature Shop in London, has created these incredible puppets for the show. They have amazing mechanisms within the, within the face so that they're capable of the huge range of emotion in the face. Um, Rigel, who is a 16-inch tall emperor, of over six billion subjects deposed. When my council hears of this, the Hynerian Navy will scorch this hellhole. <sighs> that should get him thinking. And then Pilot, who is actually part of the ship, who, if he stood up, would probably stand to be about 15 feet tall. He's a massive slug creature who is embedded into the ship, which is a living ship. <laughs> Does that mean that we've stopped sinking? Yes. We're almost completely submerged. They also created prosthetics for uh, Anthony Simcoe's character, who's Dargo, who is a Luxon warrior. And Anthony is 6'6", six, six, big voice. And with prosthetics and makeup, stands about seven feet tall. Never lay your hands on me again. The puppet creatures are interesting to play across from um, because you can't treat them as puppets. If you treat them as puppets, you stay away from them, you draw a line between you and nothing happens. Take this royal pain out of my sight. If you get in tight with them and you get your hands on them and you talk to them and you, you deal with them, the puppeteers are actors. They're performers in their own right and really quite amazing at what they do, that they react to you and the scene starts to become alive and you stop watching a puppet and watching the actor and you watch the scene between two characters. <laughs> Where's the you know what? I knew you wouldn't come back just for me. What'd you do with it? It's safe and sound. Did you swallow it? Swallow it? Yes, yes. Which means you're gonna have to take me back as I am or disembowel me here. Don't you tip me, Fluffy. Oh, no. He comes from this place where he grew up. He watched E.T. And he probably has, in his head, he does, he has this idea of what it is to meet an alien. And suddenly you have a modern-day human thrown into the situation where he's in an alien world. And it's nothing like <laughs> what's on TV. Boy, was Spielberg ever wrong. Close encounters my ass. It's nothing like what's in film. He is blown away by it and not sure what to do with it and reacts in ways that hopefully you and I would react, which is basically, oh, hell, where am I? Crichton's a fast thinker, um, but he's not re reaching the right conclusions mo most of the time, probably. He's always off balance. He's almost by default the, the leader of this group of, of alien characters because they all have their strengths, but none of them are quite as well-rounded as, as John is. He's just trying to figure things out. He's making plans. He's shooting from the hip, um, and it goes wrong as often as it goes right, and he's always off balance, and he doesn't ever know exactly what he's doing. Every time he turns the corner, he's got a new problem because he doesn't know anything about the world. He knows nothing at all about it, and he's bringing human values, he's bringing American values, you know, he's the, talk about your American abroad, 
you know, he, do, <laughs> he can't even get McDonald's at this end of the universe. And so it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be able to play. Please stay. Stay as long as you desire. She gives me a Woody. Woody, it's a human saying. I've heard you say it often when you don't trust someone or they make you nervous. They give you willies. She gives you the willies. The thing about doing science fiction is that it, it allows you to explore different ideas, different avenues in a way that you can't do in standard drama. And it, it allows you to raise very hard and interesting questions about what it is to be human um, and what it is to be moral and ethical. And also you get to tell really interesting stories and there's like fabulous alien chicks. <laughs> <laughs> Were you going to say something? We have so many setups. We have CGI, we have split screen shots, we've got creatures coming in, we've got the puppeteers all over the floor. And you go, my gosh, this is overwhelming. And yet, Brian in the middle of this knows all the pieces, knows all the components, and has a way of making everybody go, yeah, it's okay, it's good. We're also bringing in, really for the first time on television, all of the ingredients of CGI. puppets from the creature shop, the prosthetics, all of these elements coming together, you know, it's really, you know, green screens and it's, it's an incredibly detailed and complicated and exciting shoot. And Ben is perfect for the part. Ben played football all his childhood and, and, um, and he's a real all-American guy. There's always something going on behind his eyes. You know, when you talk to Ben, there's always something. He's, he's up to something. He's always got another agenda, or he's kind of amused by the situation, and, and, um, and, and he's got a certain spark that is really necessary for, for Crichton. Here in Australia, they're very egalitarian, so I don't get treated like a star. I don't get the big trailer, and I don't get to play the big one. And uh, if I do try to do that, they have something in Australia called the, paw, the, uh, the tall poppy syndrome, which means if anybody rises above a certain level, they cut them down. So uh, it's, it's good. It's a good way to work. It keeps everybody on the same level, and it works very well, I think. It's real. I can feel her. I can touch her. You were fantasizing about her. Remove her from your thoughts. Trust me, I'm trying. <clears throat> hey, hey, check the attitude, pal. Australians love to take the piss, which is to poke fun at anything and everything, and they pride themselves on being able to do that. The only thing is if you turn it on your head and you say, oh, Australia, it's just like America in the 50s, they go, what? <laughs> It's, they're wonderful people, but they're very proud. They're incredibly, incredibly proud people. The sci-fi audience is a very savvy audience. They're very intelligent, and it's a little scary to go into that realizing that, you know, they have their eye on the details. And as we're creating a series, we start from scratch. We're still creating the world, much in the same way they did with Star Trek. If you go back to the old Star Trek, you'll see well, no, no, that changed later, or they just ignored that fact. And, you know, the science fiction audience is very much aware of that. Fire. 